to take out your worship bulletin and to take the tear off out. There's a tear off there on the side of the bulletin and I'd like you to pull it off right now if you would please. And I want you to take a minute and maybe just write one word on there. You could maybe write a phrase but put your name on it if you don't mind. What's one anxiety that you have? one fear, one concern, one stress point in your life. Okay? One thing. And try to put in, if you just put it in one word, what would it be? Does anybody remember what yesterday was? August, September 23. It was prophesied by some that yesterday was when Christ was going to return. The fact is, we never know when Christ is going to return. The fact is also, we know that there's a lot of things that are happening that put us much closer to his return. Uh, wars and rumors of war, earthquake, famines, there's so much going on in our world that it very easily, Jesus very easily, everything had been in place, he could have come back yesterday. But he didn't. It causes us just to say we always need to be wise and careful in who we listen to. And the main thing also is be ready and make sure that other people are ready as well. But, but it was interesting because as I got closer to September 23, I started hearing more people that I know that were asking, um, are you watching September 23? Are you concerned about September 23? And, and there are some who, who were really becoming very anxious about what may happen yes, yesterday. Is it September 23 anywhere still? I think we're past the date line now, right? Yeah, so I don't think, it, I think we passed it. But, that, by the way, that, I really wondered when you picked that as your date for you. <laughs> get it in before Jesus comes back. Get, get married, because, you know, we don't want to miss. Like the teenagers, right? You know, Christ Jesus, please come back soon, but don't come back before I get married, okay? You know, I want to have that fun too, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, what, what is it? If you were put, to put it in one word... What causes you your most anxiety? What causes you your most stress? I, I look at Paul back there, and Paul Hager, and, uh, and he's got this wonderful um, machine that he works on <laughs> constantly. And weekends is the wonderful time that it's not being used for its proton treatment down at Loma Linda Hospital. And so, so that's when he really gets the privilege of getting called out in the middle of the night and all. And, and I can't help but think, of, if he were going to put one word, he'd put down proton. <laughs> Now then again, he might not. He might just put in engineers. <laughs> but what, what would be that one thing that, that causes you stress? And, and if you don't mind, would you write it down there? And, and listen to the message then. Because First Peter has some instructions for us about casting our anxieties on the Lord, our stresses, our th those, that, that one thing that we worry about. And he, and he also challenges us that there's a responsibility we have to take care of one another. That our brothers and sisters throughout the world are going through similar kinds of sufferings that we are. And we need to be taking care of each other. And one of the best things we can do, one of the best ways to cast our anxieties is through prayer and by prayer for one another. So there, I've given you the message. So those of you who need some rest, go to sleep. Okay. But, but be prepared when the offering uh, plate comes by. Be prepared to cast your anxiety. Now, in this case, I want you to cast it and don't grab it back. Okay, that was supposed to be funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So we cast and we keep on casting. And most of you who are worry warts, oh, there's nobody here. But most of you who take on stress and you say, okay, here, God, I'm giving it to you. Guess what? Too often it ends up right back in your hands. And it wasn't because God gave it back to you. It's because you chose to take it back. So today, when you put it in the offering plate, I want you to give, put it in the offering plate. And as quick as you can, give it to the person next to you. Okay. <laughs> Because cause I know some of you are going to be tempted to like, wait a second, God, I can't let you have that because I've got to take care of this issue. Anybody who's a controller here? Well, you don't have to admit that. <laughs> but, but taking control. It, at the heart of taking control is us not trusting. Not trusting God, not trusting somebody else. Because we've got to trust us. So just be aware of that. I want you to get ready 
trying to help you right now to get ready to dump that anxiety, that stress, whatever it might be, to put it there in the offering plate. It might be one of the best offerings you could give to God, especially today. Have any of you ever met a lion in the wild? Well, that's a shame. <laughs> Lions are rather interesting. I, had, I did have the privilege of meeting a lion in the wild. Now, fortunately, we're inside a van. We had gone to Kenya. We were going to do mission work up in the north part of Kenya. And then politics as it was, there was some disagreement between the United States and the Kenyan government, so they wouldn't allow Americans to go out into the bush. <laughs> okay, fine. So we got the privilege instead of going to Uganda. Totally different trip than what we had planned for. Instead of working out on, in the bush, we actually went into the prisons of Uganda. And amazing experiences that we had there. But on the journey, there was a couple days that they, they well, we got to take care of you before you go to Uganda. We don't know what else to do with you, so we're going to send you on a safari. Oh, cool. So we went out into the Serengeti Plain, stayed at a place out in the Serengeti Plain, and, and went on safari. And we were in the safari in this big van that, that was kind of rails up on the top, and you could see out over them and through, and you could stand up on the seats and on and look all around. And as a part of that journey, we came up on a kill on the Serengeti Plain. It's one of these amazing scenes because about right in the middle of this scene, there were about six lionesses from what I remember. They had this large gazelle that they had killed and the lion was sitting there eating. What was really funny was that as you're looking at this, the lionesses were all sitting around with their tongues like just down almost on the ground. And what had obviously happened was the lionesses had chased together, somehow made the kill, and now the lion, <laughs> the lion was sitting there. And we were about as close to this kill as I am to the back wall of the sanctuary. Drove up right there. And the lion's just kind of like, you know, ignoring us. Why? Because he had his dinner right there in front of him. He didn't need anything else, and he really wasn't concerned about us. But, see, but it was such an amazing experience because the other thing that was, what was really crazy about this experience was around us, about 50 yards away f from this kill in an entire circle, and, and some maybe even a little farther, were all the different groups of animals out on the plain that day. So there were elephants, there were laughing, the, the hyenas, there were uh, smaller uh, gazelle-type animals all around there. There were giraffes. I mean, everything. It was, it was just amazing. And yet it was quiet. So all these other animals, far enough away so that if the lion decided to run, they had a shot at getting away. But they were all, like, standing there watching. It, it, it was kind of an eerie scene. It was almost like they were watching the one who had sacrificed the, its life for the rest of them. Strange, strange scene. It also kind of reminded me of this text, the text we're going to look at today in First Peter uh, chapter 5, where, where it talks about the roaring lion, and that we're supposed to resist the roaring lion by standing still because the roaring lion is trying to scare us and cause us to run. And we were taught that one of the things that they talked about that day was the reason lionesses had, all, had their tongues hanging out was because they had gone up at a different direction. The lion's over here. He's probably did, made some roar. The, the, this gazelle had run, and they trapped the gazelle. The lionesses did, working together. They ran, ran that gazelle down. That, and by the way, gazelles are much faster than lions, but lions are sneakier. Okay? And so they'd killed, they'd killed that gazelle. And, and Peter is going to instruct us today something that's really important when it comes to spiritual battle. We need to not allow fear to cause us to run from Satan and the power of darkness. Fear is going, is, wants to cause us to take off. Think, for example, untruths, that, we're not, that we don't have the ability to defeat evil, that, that, that we're going to be in danger because evil is going to attack us, and oh, no, we're going to fail. No, fear, fear and evil start to work together. It's interesting, by the way, another verse that you might just want to put there on your paper or keep in your pocket. Perfect love drives out fear. 
And who, who demonstrated perfect love to us other than Jesus Christ? And perfect love drives out fear. And even when I start to love God back, in other words, when I worship, I'm actually going to drive out fear. I'm actually going to drive out darkness. Well, the text this morning from First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. And I want you to take note of the very first word, at least in the New International Version. The very first word, humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The very first word is humble. And the second one, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. It's an interesting word here. Uh, By the way, the Greeks and the Romans didn't have a word for for humility in their language. Because they thought that humility was a really bad thing. It was a sign of weakness. In fact, it was the word used for somebody that they had captured in battle... So now they've defeated this other soldier, this other enemy, and that enemy was called humbled or even humiliated. To be humble literally means to think or judge with lowliness and thus speaks of humiliation of mind, lowliness of mind, lowly thinking, the quality of unpretentious behavior, a humble attitude. Modesty comes from it or to be without arrogance. Philippians 2.3 Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And, and Proverbs says a similar statement in Proverbs 11.2 When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. E- Edwards, in his commentary, says, True humility is not putting ourselves down. Take note of this but rather lifting up others. If we concentrate on lifting others up, putting down ourselves will take care of itself. As we go through life exalting Christ and others, then genuine humility will be inevitable. However, if we exalt ourselves, guess what? God will take care of our humiliation for us. And he promises what? To humble the proud. By the way, I think it's a lot less painful to go the route of humility than to be humbled by God. I love a quote that I found from Plato. You know, Plato was not a God follower, right? Didn't believe in God being creator. And yet, listen to how he defined humility. He said, it's that state of mind which submits to the divine order of the universe and does not impiously exalt itself. Well, that's pretty profound for a guy who doesn't believe in God, isn't it? <laughs> it submits to the, to the divine power of the universe and doesn't exalt itself. But see, but see, for the Greek, their whole thought was no. We're going to exalt ourselves because we're greater, we're more important, we're more significant, we're better than everybody else. We know how to do things. We're prideful Americans. Oh, excuse me, not Americans. I was talking about the Greeks, wasn't I? Pentecost asks, the, the Greeks prided themselves on being better than other men. They considered it something to be proud of, to acknowledge their superiority. A man so perverted not to think of himself as being a superior person was called by this word, humble. If the army, successful in battle, took a number of captives whose lives they spared to become servants, these servants might rightly think of themselves by this word, humble-minded. But for a Greek, you would never use that word to describe yourself. (laughs) 
J. Vernon McGee, g- gentleman who um, was a great Bible teacher on air um, with the Bible and just taught, taught many. And, and he, speaking of something which related to yesterday to September 23, says, it's only when you and I come in humility that we are able to know the grace of God. In view of the coming of Christ, humility should be the attitude of the child of God. Christ is the one who will establish justice and make things right when he comes. You cannot straighten out this world, although you may think that you can. Even Jesus pointed this out, didn't he? When he said, for all those who exalt themselves, they will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Luke 14, verse 11. Peter goes on when he says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand and in due time he will lift you up. When, when it's right, when, when, when God knows that you need to be lifted up. That's what Virgil was talking about with his daughter today. Amen? Times of pain and heartache and difficulty that went over years. But in due time, God lifted her up. You know, but it's not just Kim, Ken too. Going through a three-year process of the, the death of his wife, mother of his children, and trying to deal with that. And that, that's a heartache. That's a difficulty you know, to, walk, to walk through that valley like that with your children, even though they were older still. But, but to walk through that and to go through that kind of sorrow, say goodbye to the one that you'd committed your life to live with forever, And what happened? Say goodbye. Cast your anxieties on me. He says, look, you got to humble yourself under me. And when when I know it's right, then I'm going to lift you up. And we do praise God for the way he's brought the two of you together with all those pieces of that journey. But that's what God's doing in each of our lives, isn't he? Don's here. we, We say goodbye to Kristen. And how do you deal with that, that pain? Because, because he didn't even have hardly time. I mean, that, 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 that year went so fast on. And Kristen was here, and she was supposed to be taking care of you, wasn't she, Virgil? And, and we ex- actually expected that you were going to be moving out here, Don. <laughs> Maybe you still will <laughs> if you get that other job. <laughs> but he says, humble yourself under me. We don't understand everything, do we? The pains and the trials and the difficulties of life, and, and, and we even weep through them, we struggle through them, but, but God's given us this promise, if you'll put yourself in my hands in due time, I will lift you up. I will strengthen you. And don't, don't miss the last verses in our text this morning, but he says, I'm going to restore you, strengthen you, establish you. I'm going to bless you. But we've got to stay humbled under his, under his hands. And in order to do that, I think that that's why Peter then goes on with this next instruction. And he says, cast all your anxieties on me. And we can do that, he says, because he cares about us. Did you know that worry is the number one mental health disorder in America? (laughs) Number one, top of the list. (laughs) It beats out addiction. Can you believe that, Sean? (laughs) Worry. In fact, Minerth Meyer says it's a feeling of uneasiness, apprehension, or dread usually related to negative thoughts of something that may happen in the future. What does Peter say? Turn our attention to God. We need to trust something that's beyond ourselves. When you're worried, it really helps to talk to somebody else. And then fourthly, throw your cares on the Lord. Sometimes there's all you can all you can do is here it is, God, I can't take it anymore. And you literally throw it into his hands. Do you know what? And, and I, I apologize right now because I'm going to point out a truth that some of you are not going to like. Worry is about distrusting God and trusting ourselves. Let me just say that one more time. Worry is about distrusting God and trusting ourselves. 
we're going to hold on to it. Because we're the ones who have to take care of it. And God, we don't trust you with this, so that's why we're going to spin and churn and get all upset because we're going to trust us. Martin DeHaan said, worry is unbelief in disguise. Worry is like a rocking chair. <laughs> it will give you, some, give you something to do, but it won't let you go anywhere. <laughs> worry gives a small thing a big shadow. Have you seen the commercial with, the, you know, with, the, with the, the, the cat? And it's supposed to look like a tiger that's walking out there. And you see the shadow cast up on the wall. And like, whoa, look at that big tiger over there. And it's a little kitty cat that's walking by. It's sim similar in structure. Matthew 6.34 said, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. <laughs> Count on it, okay? There will be something you can worry about tomorrow. So why, why go to tomorrow? Stick with today because each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> I found a story by, by um, Arthur and he said, and, and in this story it says, uh, I have a mountain of credit card debt, one told another. I've lost my job, my car is being repossessed, and our house is in foreclosure. But I'm not worried about it. <laughs> not worried about it, exclaimed his friend. No, I've hired a professional worrier. He does all my worrying for me. And that way I don't have to think about it. His friend responded, that's fantastic. How much does your professional worrier charge for his services? $50,000 a year, replied the first man. $50,000 a year? Where are you going to get that kind of money? I don't know, came the reply. That's his worry. <laughs> this, this word worry and anxiety, it's interesting because it comes from the word to divide or to draw different directions, to get kind of pulled different ways. As you're worrying, you're, you're getting pulled apart and divided. Warren Wiersbe writes, we have little control over the circumstances of our life, right? We can't control the weather or the economy. Can any of you? I think we can. We can't control what other people say about us <laughs> or what they do to us. There's only one area where we have control. We can rule the kingdom inside. The heart of every problem is the problem in our heart. Once we get to that throne room inside us and let God take over, we don't have to worry about others. So what does Peter say? He says, cast your anxieties on him because he cares about you. And that word there for casting is a phrase which means cast and keep on casting. Like I was sharing with the children, we tend to cast it, grab it back, cast it, grab it back. And Peter is saying, cast your anxieties because he cares. Notice. When you've grabbed it back, you must have forgotten that God cares. You must have forgotten how much he loves you, how much he's a part of whatever you're facing, and that he's not forgetting you, he's not ignoring you. So I, I was wondering this week, you know, so how do we do that? How do we cast our anxieties on God? You know, can't just get the fishing pole out. So how are we going to do that? And I and can't help but thinking, I know it's one of my favorite passages. I remind you of it often, but I got to do it again. It's from Philippians, the fourth chapter. And what does is, what is Paul say? Do not be anxious about anything. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, there's like a commandment now we got to deal with. This is not a, you know, okay, well, you know, there's some things that you should be anxious about. He says, do not be anxious about anything. He gives it as a ruling. It's a command. It's a definite. He's saying, do this, but in every situation. So what am I supposed to do? If, if I'm going to avoid sin, because that would be sin, then if I'm holding on to anxiety, oh, great, now I feel bad about that. Now I'm stressed out because I'm worrying too. And that's a sin. So great, now I'm messing up God. And so now I'm going through this divided thing, right? And he says, as you're doing that, he says, here's what you should do. But in every situation... By prayer, conversing with God, and petition, help, Lord, with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus, that you're here, right? <laughs> Present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So with prayer, present. 
talk it out to him. And I love that he uses all those different kinds of words to describe that, you know, with prayer. So you're in conver conversation, you know, hey, God's stressed out today, but no, you're here with me. But most of us, when we're stressed out, is God, help me, please. And, and, and that's with petition. But it's also a sense of thanksgiving. Lord, I know you care. Help me to understand that. Help me to believe that. Help me to see you. Help me just to trust you. I thank you, God, that you're trustworthy. And so you're in, into thanksgiving. And what does he say? That then the peace of God, which goes beyond understanding, is going to guard our heart, that place where we start to get all divided, where the knots are churning inside. He says, I'll guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus with a peace that, that you can't create. So he says, so how should we do it? How do we cast? Do it. <laughs> do it with Jesus. Talk it out. Go to him. Converse with him. It's what the psychologist would be challenging you to do. Open it up. Say what's going on inside. Be honest about it. Don't hide anything. Share it with emotion if you have to. Scream it out if you, if you need to. But go ahead and cast it to the one that you know cares about you. And if you're questioning that, then that might be where you start. God, I'm not sure I can trust you. I'm going to be honest about that. I'm not sure that you really have my best interests in mind. And by the way, when you, when you start talking like that, listen to yourself. <laughs> it might have an influence on how you're now going to keep praying, you know. Oh, yeah, God, I'm really saying that you're a God who doesn't care. Hmm, might want to check that one, shouldn't I, God? So, so listen to yourself. And as you're praying, he says, look, pray, talk, cry with thanksgiving, and God will give you peace. But when you do that, what does Peter go on to say? He says, be watchful, be sober. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, and he's seeking someone to devour. And one of the things that we know is evil wants to devour you. Evil wants to mess us up. Evil wants to destroy us. Evil is our opponent. Evil is diabolical and, and is out for destruction of us and, and God's work. Evil is hiding, waiting to pounce on you. I'll come back to that. And by the way, evil generally attacks when you have a need. I mentioned the Serengeti Plain earlier, and there's a man named John Sh George Schaller who has done research on the lions in the Serengeti Plain. <laughs> Incidentally, in that research, and I, this one surprised me, he said that in our research, we found that it didn't matter whether there was we feels, 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 didn't matter which those wheels were upwind, half of the kills were downwind. Now, you kind of think a lion would be not too smart to be downwind, right? Because the prey smells, lion in the area, run! But that's not what happens because there's a bigger understanding and behavior of the lion. <clears throat> Let me read from uh, Schaller's research. He says, uh, he watched a, a group of Thompson's gazelles crossing a patch of thick bush in order to drink. When they entered the thick bush, it was bristling with lions that instantly grabbed and ate one of the gazelles. Over the next two hours, the same group of gazelles, having apparently forgotten the recent murder of one of their companions, tried not once, but twice more to get to the water using the same route with the same predictable results. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> In speaking of this, I have no desire to be like the gazelles when it comes to avoiding the devil and his schemes. This is a lady writing about this. She says, therefore, it behooves me to know more about a lion's hunting habits. Lions do most of their hunting at twilight or in the night. As the lion is said to be the king of the jungle, Satan is said to be what? The ruler of darkness. Lions are not very fast, yet they hunt some of the fastest animals on the planet. Consequently, a lion has two hunting styles. First is stalking his prey from cover to cover, and then with a final burst comes out from hiding and captures his prey. If the lion should get spotted by the stalking prey, guess what the lion does? The lion sees, the prey comes up and sees the lion hiding over there. So what does the lion do? The lion stands up and looks the other direction as if to kind of communicate to the prey. By the way, I've still got my eye on you. To communicate to the prey, you know, no big deal. I'm just looking out here, checking things out. You've got nothing to fear as long as you just, you know, ignore me. That's what the lion's trying to make the prey to believe. So the, the lion hides and, <laughs> and tries to pretend that he's just minding his own business, not going to do anything to hurt the victim. The second style is to find a bush. And, and you find a bush close to something that the prey needs. Like these lions who were hiding in the bush 
where the water was. And so they wait for the prey to come for something that they need. And in each case, the, what was it, three of them died. Prey animals are most afraid of a lion when they can't be seen. When a lion does appear, many prey animals simply stare at the lion. Uh, as if to say, if I see and I'm aware of you, then I'm safe. <laughs> really? <laughs> I see you, lion, so therefore I'm okay. Yeah, right. By the time they realize that they're in danger, it's often too late to react and to avoid the eventual harm. Be watchful, folks. Some of you are not too happy about this idea. But the powers of darkness are out there, and they are waiting to pounce and to harm us and to hinder us. At least they can't take you out of the kingdom of heaven. Just, can I just remind you of that? No evil force, no power of Satan, no demon. In fact, if you question me on this, read Romans 8, the latter part of there, that says, neither heights nor depths, principalities or powers. Same phrase that Paul used in Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers. None of these powers can take us away from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from him, but they sure can play havoc on us and try to hinder us from being someone who others will see Jesus in our lives. They want to defeat us. And so what are we supposed to do? We need to resist him, it says. Resist them, standing firm in your faith, for you know your brothers throughout the world are going through the same kind of suffering. Anybody here have allergies? Anybody take an antihistamine? Uh, now, I'm, I'm still not totally scientifically uh, quite understand this, but an antihistamine is a histamine blocker. Okay, histamine actually, if I understand it correctly, and I'm sure somebody who's medically more profound than I will, will help us be clar clarify this, but if I understand it correctly, the well, some of the things that happens is the histamine attacks our cells, and, and so the, the, the thing that's causing the allergy, and what do we do? We get itchy eyes and runny nose and all those other things that go along with, uh, with an allergy, right? And so an antihistamine does what? An antihistamine blocks that histamine from taking over the cell. And it's a, a histamine blocker. Well, the re why do I bring this up? Because when Paul, Peter says to resist him, firm in your faith, that's what the word that is used there. It's not exact, but when I'm looking at the Greek, I'm like, here's what it is. It is antihistamine. That's, doesn't that sound like an antihistamine? So here's what I want to challenge you to do. When evil's attacking, get out your antihistamine. Okay. Take your antihistamine pill. And what, what is that? See, to antihistamine means to arrange in battle against which pictures a face-to-face -face confrontation. Okay? You're in battle with powers of darkness. He says, don't run from the powers of darkness. Stand your ground. Take up his, and, and listen, he says, it's used to refer to an army arranging in battle against the enemy force and so to array against it. They're getting face to face. They're getting ready for a fight. It means to set oneself against, to stand firm against, to, to someone's onset, to oppose, to resist by actively opposing pressure or power, to withstand. It involves not only our attitude, but a corresponding behavior. I am not going to give in to the powers of darkness, and, and I'm not going to let them take over, and I'm not going to allow them to defeat me. So I'm going to take a stand, and I'm going to go face to face with that power of darkness because the Word of God tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so therefore, in the name of Jesus Christ, I have authority. You sang it earlier by the testimony, by our testimony and the blood of the Lamb of God. We have power and authority over darkness. So stand your ground. Face it. Get ready to do battle. Because guess what? The fight's going on whether you want to fight them or not. <laughs> should have everyone who's ever tempted just to stand up just to show everyone here that there's not a person in this room that's not in the battle. The question is, when you're in the battle, what are you going to do? Are you going to use the resources that God's offering to you? Resist him, standing firm in your faith. Don't run. That's what the gazelle also does. Runs and takes off, and guess what? Well, you don't have to worry about the lion because he's lazy. You've got to worry about the lionesses, who are many, who will track you down. 
Tom Constable says, whereas God commands us to forsake the world and deny the lust of the flesh, we should resist the devil. Satan's desire is to get the Christian to doubt, to deny, to disregard, to disobey whatever God has said. Satan wants you to get you to move away from God. Really, that's what he wants. But Satan wants us to flee from the very presence of the one who has the resources to help us to be victorious. And what does he say instead? He says, stand firm. Stand firm. But guess what? Flee sin. Think of this. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee immorality. We're supposed to run from immorality. In, in 1 Corinthians 10, we're supposed to flee idolatry, anything that puts itself in the place of God. In 1 Timothy 6, we're supposed to flee those things like the love of money, you man of God, he says. And then 2 Timothy 2.22, he says, flee from youthful lusts. Stand firm was the instruction in Ephesians 6. Hold your ground. Face the powers of darkness because they do not have the authority to be victors over you. And instead, stand firm. And by the way, that's when we also need to hear stand together. Isn't marriage the best example of this? Jesus said, where two or more of you are gathered together in my name, and if you agree on anything, there I am. And you can ask anything, and I will do it. Do you know what twosome has the most potential for agreement on something? Most couples tend to vote the same way, don't they? <laughs> most, most couples share their opinions with one another, and they come to agreement. Have you thought and understood why it is that marriage is under so much battle? that the marriages of spiritual leaders is under attack consistently? Why? Because the powers of darkness understand that the greatest twosome, the greatest unity, the greatest two that can agree is a husband and wife. And that if they will unite together and agree on anything in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I'll do it. Do you realize what kind of power is available? Couples to you as you unite together. And you realize why evil wants to ruin everything about your marriage. Pull you apart, cause you not to trust, cause you to be at enmity and strife. It's because marriage is that place where we have the best opportunity to agree and unite and God to respond. And by the way, can I warn you about this? Do you know who the lions like to usually pick off? The stragglers. The, the rebellious ones are like, I'm going to go out there and wander around by myself. And lions are waiting for you to wander by yourself. And they look for the weak, the sick, the older um, gazelles and like that who can't run as fast, and they pick them off and they take them down. And uh, it, 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 darkness is looking for that in us. Romans says it this way, for just as each of us, verse, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to one another. In order to fight the battle, we need to stand together. We are members of one another. This makes membership in any kind of a church so much more powerful than we've understood it. To, for too many decades, we've thought of membership as just putting my name up there on, a, on some kind of a list. Uh, yeah, I'm a member of Crestline First Baptist. No, no, membership is so much deeper and so much more supernatural than that. Membership says I belong to you and you belong to me. We have a connection, a concern for each other. We're going to bear each other's burdens. We're going to stand together. We're going to fight that fight together. Because when you feel, I'm feeling. When you're hurting, I'm hurting. When you're struggling, I'm struggling. When you're tempted, I'm tempted. And we're going to go into this battle together. Why should we fight it out there by ourselves? Why should we try to stand alone? Because that's what darkness wants us to do. Darkness wants us to face the battle out there all alone. Because hope, because we we can handle it. Did you hear where we started this morning? The very first word of our text is the opposite of what I just described. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand that in due time 
he will lift you up. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares about you. Be watchful. Folks, watch out. The devil is, roaring like a, is prowling around like a roaring lion. He's seeking someone to devour, and he wants it to be you. Resist him, standing firm in your faith. You know your brothers throughout the world are going through the same kind of suffering. So join together. Don't do this alone. Support one another. Take care of one another. Stand together. Calvin writes this. It's another consolation that we have a contest in common with all the children of God. For Satan dangerously tries us when he separates us from the body of Christ. Some of you who were here last week remember the text that we used last Sunday. In our passage from James 4, 7, sub submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the main point that we made last week is that if you're going to resist the devil, because notice it says, if you resist the devil, he's going to flee. That really ties together with this week's passage. Stand firm. Face him. Don't run from him. Don't pretend he's not there. But notice, in order to do that, you've got to remember what we said last week. And that is first, you've got to submit to God. The beginning of standing against Satan and standing firm is submitting to God. Peter just said it a different way. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Submit to him. That's what worship should be about. That we submit to God. And as we humble ourselves to him, then we have the ability and the power and the authority to stand against the powers of darkness. And what does he promise us? What he promises us is that if we'll stand firm, if we'll come together like that, if, if we'll do battle like that, he promises, do you see it in verse 10? And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He says, look, if, if you'll focus on me, you'll humble yourself to me, you'll fight the fight, you'll, you'll do the battle. He says, I'll restore you. I'll put you back together. I'll mend your wounds. I'll take the pain and I'll, I'll restore you. He says, I'll make you strong as brothers. I'll make it possible for you to hold ha your hands up of one another like Aaron and Hur did for Moses. And he says, I'll give you that strength to do that for one another. And he, and he says, I'll make you so firm that the church will get stronger even under persecution. That rather than getting weaker, you will become stronger for me. And I'll make you steadfast like the man with a house on the rock. And you'll be able to handle any storm. And then how does he conclude this text for this morning? Give glory to God, church. Give glory to God. I've seen it more than once. When the spirit of the Antichrist has tried to cause us to get afraid. It happened when I was doing my thesis. It's happened other times as well. When the, the presence of evil wants us to be afraid and cause us to run. Some of you remember the story, don't you? I'm writing my thesis and, and in writing my thesis about spiritual warfare, I've got uh, some notes there, and all of a sudden they disappear, and on my screen is 666. That, that's the number of the beast, in case anybody's wondering. It's the number of the Antichrist. It's the number, and 6 is the number for humanity, too. But 666 is the number of the beast, the Antichrist. And, and that now is over a whole section of my thesis. And the bummer is I've been working on this thesis, trying to send it to my, doc, to, to my doctoral committee and all, and, and, and now it's gotten damaged. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, not only am I getting a chill down my back because 666 there, actually, frankly, to be honest, I didn't get a chill yet. I got ticked. What's 666 doing on my thesis? And then suddenly I'm like, oh, no. What did I lose? Fortunately, before I went forward, I went backwards. I hit the, the backwards button, right, where you go back to see, okay, what just got changed? And underneath 666 was this. You, dear, child, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 1 John 4.4. 4. And it suddenly hit me, and then I got the chill down my back. 
because it suddenly hit me that 666 that the spirit of the Antichrist was trying to attack the very truth of God's word on that paper which said greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world give glory to God church because God is way more powerful than evil they are I've said it before they are not equal foes and don't allow yourself to think that Satan is equal to God because he is not. Give glory to God, church. Jude said it this way, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. I have three brief questions to conclude with this morning. Have you given your life to Christ? You know if you have or not. You know if you said, yes, Jesus, I'm submitting fully to you. I thank you for dying on that cross and rising from the dead, and I believe you are real, and I, and I want you to run my life instead of me. And second question have you given your anxieties to Christ? Did you write down a word on that paper? And are, are you ready to give it away? The thing that you're most stressed out over, the thing that causes you the most anxiety, will you give it to him and not grab it back right away? Have you given your anxieties, your worries, your fears to Christ? And the third question is, have you committed to being a member of the body? students, when we're asking to adopt you, what is the main thing we're asking to do for you? We're asking for the privilege to pray for you. And when you allow us to do that, you're saying, I'm committing to the body of Christ. I'm going to allow the body of Christ to help take care of me. And maybe we'll give you some treats too, chocolates or cookies or something like that if you want them. But, but, but more than that, it's to pray for one another. But go, fo folks, it's not just for them, is it? Every week we ask you for your prayer concerns, for your needs, for what's going on in your life. And we, we say we promise to pray for you. And we have a group that do. We have, did you know that Jan Stowe and, and Virgil Stowe have their house open at 10 a, excuse me, 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning for people just to come pray? And what do we pray over Virgil? We pray over the prayer, prayer requests. Pray for them by name. There's only two or three of us that come there. But they got room for more. Have you committed to that kind of membership in the body of Christ that says, I'm going to help hold up other people? That's what happens in our life groups. Right? right? Guys, we, some of us meet on thir Saturday morning at 7 a.m. What are we there for? We're there to, to, to encourage and challenge and exhort and pray for one another because we see that we're in this together. We're members of one another. Have you committed to that kind of membership with one another in the body of Christ? Hey, you don't even have to stay here in this church to do that, do you? <laughs> it's a commitment, though, you make to that larger body, to other people that you're going to share your life with and you're going to share with them, too, because God doesn't want us to fight the battle out there alone. He's called us to do it together. So have you committed your life to Christ? Have you committed your anxieties to Christ? And have you committed to that kind of membership where you say, I'm going to go ahead and open up my heart and soul and allow some others to take care of me as well? Let's pray. God, <clears throat> well, we live in a world that's trying to make everything and everyone a devil, it seems like, and, and yet we tend to not believe that the devil exists. We're in such a harsh, hostile environment, and yet we also are in a world that wants to pretend that you don't exist. And evil roars and causes us to run in fear. And evil causes us to be anxious and nervous and try to deal with those anxieties on our own. Jesus, may that not be so for those of us here today. So Jesus, we believe. Jesus, we're ready to give you our anxieties. And Jesus, we want to connect to your whole body. 
Jesus' name. Amen.